Hello, everyone, and welcome to Targeted Oncology and Ovarian Cancer Virtual Tumor Board. We're so excited to have you. I've got two wonderful people here with myself, and we're very excited to talk to you a little bit about ovarian cancer, especially um, management with in line of all the new uh, approvals that we've seen over the last few months. So thank you so much for, for joining us. We're going to be focused today on advanced ovarian cancer. Um, in today's presentation, my colleagues and I will review three clinical cases. We will discuss an individualized approach to treatment for each patient and we'll review key clinical trial data that impact our decisions. I am Dr. Shannon Weston from the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. And today I'm joined by my colleagues, Dr. Thomas Krivak from the Allegheny Health Network in Pennsylvania and Dr. Chad Hamilton from the Inova Shar uh, Cancer Institute in Virginia. Hi there, very glad to be here. Welcome. So thank you for joining us. Before we get started on our first case, I'd like to discuss several additions to the NCCN guidelines along with new FDA approvals. I'm fortunate to be able to talk a little bit about what things have changed in primary therapy for advanced ovarian cancer. And really over the just the last few weeks, we've had a number of really exciting approvals. And so I'm just going to take a few minutes to just review um, what we know about the treatment of upfront uh, patients with upfront ovarian cancer, specifically focusing on maintenance strategies, which is exciting um, to be able to do. So First, let's go back in time a little bit to uh, GOG-218. I think many of us are very familiar with these data, looking at the um, addition of bevacizumab to adjuvant chemotherapy. This was a randomized um, three-arm trial where one arm received just standard paclitaxel chemo uh, carboplatin chemotherapy. The next arm had this chemotherapy in addition to bevacizumab, followed by a placebo maintenance. And then the third arm had the combination of the chemotherapy with bevacizumab, followed by bevacizumab maintenance. And the primary endpoint for this study was progression-free survival. And of note, the patients received 15 months of uh, bevacizumab as a maintenance. And as we remember, the, the progression-free survival difference was really predominantly between the patient population that had um, the bevacizumab throughout. So bevacizumab with chemotherapy followed by bevacizumab maintenance. It was a reduction in the risk of progression of about 30% with an absolute difference in about three to four months, um, depending on how you're identifying progression. But there was no difference with overall survival. Now, there have been some interesting subset analyses that indicate perhaps in a patient population that is stage four disease, that this can pro provide potentially some overall overall survival benefit, but you obviously have to be very cautious uh, whenever you're looking at these post hoc um, subset analyses. Now, we, of course, are about to talk about a number of different indications with PARP inhibition, and so it's really important to look at biomarkers for PARP inhibition in, um, in regards to the findings from GUG218 and the efficacy of bevacizumab. But really, there was a slightly better outcomes with that, those patient populations that had a BRCA mutation or were known to have some aberration that led to a homologous recombination deficiency you know, overall, but really when you look at progression-free survival, it didn't seem that um, the bevacizumab arms were favored. When you look at those forest plots um, below, it actually kind of is leaning more towards favoring uh, control in the, the positive biomarkers, but obviously these are not you know, statistically significant findings. And then we always have to talk if we're adding something to chemo, if we're adding a maintenance, what are the side effects? What are the adverse events? And you know, obviously the, the number one of concern is GI events. We worry about perforation and really um, dangerous events. And overall, they found that those were increased, but you know, in, in the bevacizumab groups, but not by too much. The, the majority of the patients where kind of the biggest um, adverse events were found was, was hypertension and some proteinuria. But I think we've all gotten very comfortable with managing these. And so so, you know, adverse events are generally not an issue if you're deciding um, whether or not to use this agent. 